So right now we have Michael Peck, who is the North American representative for the Mondragon uh, cooperatives in Spain. He's been in this position for the past 14 years, and he recently co-launched co -launched the One Worker, One Vote nonprofit, which is dedicated to solving Americans' unhealthy and unequal opportunities, mobility, and, and wealth divides by promoting equal share worker ownership. As you notice today, we have quite a focus on worker ownership. Um, Michael, this is one of the, the solutions. Michael was instrumental in bringing the leading Spanish wind turbine manufacturer to Pennsylvania, which invested over $220 million and created 1,000 green jobs during the 2004 to 2010 timeframe, and was hailed in 2008 as a model U.S. green economy company. He serves on the Blue-Green Alliance Corporate Advisory Council and the American Sustainable Business Council Board. He also participated in forming the Mondragon and United Steelworkers Union Partnership in 2009 to create a union co-op hybrid with the goal of revamping U.S. manufacturing through worker empowerment and ownership. Please welcome Michael Peck. Good morning, everybody. I hope you feel alive and positive because this is going to be a positive presentation. So Gar asked the question, what must we do now? And David says, it's about our stories. We we have the wrong stories, the wrong culture, the wrong structure to our stories. And since David and Fran are extremely important to me and to all of us, um, I think we need to pay attention to those benchmarks and answer those questions. And I also want to thank Georgia for giving so much attention to Mondragon. We deeply appreciate it. We humbly thank you for that. And to my two co-founders of One Worker, One Vote, there's nine of us actually, but Libby Scholes from the California Council of Churches and Carmen Huertas Noble from CUNY Law School. So thank you both for being here. So let's start with stories. I have a lot of slides. I don't really like slides. I don't, I don't fit into the PowerPoint mentality as many others have said. Um, so I'm gonna riff for a while and see if I can't come to grips with where I think we are based on two very fertile days of discussion and analysis on what's wrong and here to offer an avenue for what's right and what could be better. So let's start with Mondragon. Who here in this room has never heard of Mondragon? All right, you're not alone. <laughs> um, so I will just, you know, one with the good idea is a majority. I will just give a very simple paragraph explanation. We're a 60-year-old experience founded by a village priest. He really was the substitute village priest because when the, the person they sent saw the 50% unemployment, the famine, the cholera, the rubble after the Spanish Civil War and World War II, if you've seen Picasso's Guernica, it's kind of a good explanation. He, he left and the substitute village priest showed up and everything started from that point. And it started with collaboration with soccer games because when people play sports together, they collaborate. And he opened a little school and that school gradu graduated five engineers who formed a kerosene stove cooperative. And out of that came a movement today that has 80,000 worker owners, $24 billion in sales, our own bank, our own insurance company, our own university, and the winner of the Financial Times 2013 Boldness in Business Award, which is the highest award that the Financial Times gives. And we've been written about by everybody. We are in every graduate school. It's hard not to find somebody either visiting us or writing about us. We need to learn how to write about ourselves as fast as everybody else writes about us, but that's, that's another problem. 
But last year we had a huge disaster because there's another saying that we have at Mondragon, which is maybe our most important saying, which is that this is not paradise and we are not angels. That the worst thing you can do when you're trying to do something better is start to clap yourself on the back and drink your own bathwater. So, so we had a huge failure uh, in Mondragon, our first cooperative. Remember that little kerosene stove, first cooperative. It grew to be Fagor, and uh, it ended up being a $2 billion cooperative. It had a couple thousand worker owners. It had 37% of the marketplace in Spain for domestic white goods, stoves, kitchens, bathrooms. You know, in 2008, the great tsunami happened to Spain also, and the construction sector got wiped out. It was 10% of the market. Fagor had 37% of that market. It allowed the, the profit margins uh, for Fagor to continue and survive, uh, to compete against the low-cost entry uh, participants in what was essentially a mature industry. Well, without that domestic margin, market margin, Fagor ended up failing, but not because we didn't try at Mondragon to keep it alive. We invested 300 million euros, that's like $450 million over five years, trying to keep it going because everybody had come out of Fagor, because we had an emotional attachment to it, because it was the first cooperative. And last year, we decided that we had reached the diminishing point of marginal returns, and when they, when they presented um, another uh, plan that cost, would cost 167 million euros more, uh, the Governing Council unanimously voted not to do that, and that was a huge shock because nobody at Mondragon thought that would ever happen. I mean, our graphs have been rising. We're the seventh largest industrial group in Spain. We're in 30 countries around the world. We have 19 uh, factories in China, just for example. So they said no, and immediately we went into canectonic deer in the headlights shock. I might also point out that Mondragon has a zero uh, budget allocation for external media, publications, PR, image, enhancement. We spend nothing on that. We do spend an inordinate amount of money on internal communications. We think it's a 24-7 job, and we think you can never assume anything, especially people understanding their roots. So internal, const internal and constant, consistent communication is something we focus on, but external communication, we leave that to all of you. And that was a big problem when you have a failure of your first major cooperative in 60 years. So everybody took a whack at us. The uh, economists said that you can't scale cooperatives, Mondragon. Even Mondragon were lying in the dust of the 2008 global financial wipeout. Of course, the Wall Street Journal, who never liked us anyway, um, quoted all the wrong people and said that um, obviously cooperatives have had a brush in with reality. Um, but none of that was true. Uh, what, what did we really do? Well, the first thing we did, because we are practitioners of the solidarity economy, all of us voted for a 1.5% salary reduction unanimously, which went to a special uh, fund inside our own mutual called Laguna Oro, which topped off an already robust fund, robust fund that we've been preparing over the years when things were good to make sure we could do what we say we're going to do when things are bad. That's the first thing we did. Then we voted for another 50 million euro fund out of our corporate treasury to make sure we backstop the Fagor workers. We kept all of those Fagor workers at 85% salary and benefits. And with eight, within eight months, eight months of the failure, we had not only cross-trained but found jobs for 1,500 of those 2,000 workers in our group. The remaining 400 still remain um, on that 85% benefit, but we found a buyer who's now willing to come in and take over Fagor, not as a cooperative, but as a functioning company, and who has committed to creating locally 700 jobs. So if you add up the numbers, we are plus 300 out of this experience. And there is a lesson, or there are a lot of lessons, to be learned from this. One, when you own your own means of production, when you own your own decision-making processes, when you own your own supply chains, what does this allow you to do? It allows you to buy time. And when you buy time, it turns out that human beings are amazingly resourceful in terms of the, of the solutions that they can come up with. And, and necessity is really the madre and the padre of invention. The other thing it teaches us is that there is another way. In this country, what happens when companies fail? I've seen it with my own eyes, and so have you. Uh, the equipment gets bundled up and shipped off. The executives 
land with golden parachutes. The people are in the streets, a lot of them without benefits. The towns get hollowed out. We lose a generation of productivity. Really weak and increasingly weaker uh, social platforms and mechanisms step in. Hardly anything comes up in its space, and we spend years and years and years trying to realize what happened to these vital losses of our manufacturing DNA. That didn't happen in Mondragon. And so out of that, I think sometimes we learn a lot more from our failures than our successes. So I, that's the Fagor story. That, to me, David, is a good story. It has culture, it has values, and it has a happy ending. I'm going to tell you a story about Denver, Colorado. In Denver, uh, the taxicab business is run by three companies, and uh, they are all owned by out-of-state um, monopolies. Uh, and the taxicab drivers in Denver uh, drive a cab 16 hours a day, and they have to tithe over uh, $1,200 a week uh, before they get to take some money home. We have a lot of East African immigrants in the Denver area from Somali, Sudan, Ethiopia. And the reason why these individuals who in their own country were highly trained, doctors, teachers, lawyers, etc., uh, the reason why they chose to become taxi drivers is because it allowed them the luxury, the freedom, the independence of saying no to a call to spend more time with their family if their family needed them. In other words, they wanted the individual right to choose between uh, helping out their family if a need arose or going out and doing a job. And that was the primary characteristic that drove them uh, to becoming taxi cab drivers. It's not what you would normally find if you ask somebody in San Francisco and Carmen, certainly not in New York City. Um, although I do think it's a very interesting aspect to maybe enter into the taxi driver culture. But they made that decision and what they found out was that when you drive 12 hours, 12 hours or 16 hours a day, you're, you're burned out the last four hours. Your service isn't good, accidents happen. And so they decided to form a union, but they also wanted to form a cooperative. Why? Because they thought, this is America. This is the land of ownership. This is the land of self-reliance. Let's own what we do. It took them three years. They were helped by the Communications Workers uh, Union, the CWA. And uh, now they have 38 worker owners in this union co-op. They drive eight hours a day. Everybody drives a Prius. It's new and it's clean. If you're in Denver, take the Union Taxi app. I used it last weekend. It is excellent service. Um, and they tithe over $800 a month to the taxi cab driver. $800 a month instead of $1,200 a week. And the real bottom line of the story is that I spoke to um, Lisa Bolton, the, uh, the local, the CWA union local president yesterday, she told me that um, the reason why she couldn't get back to my emails is because they had 500 taxicab drivers from other taxicab entities signing uh, cards in her union to join this organization. So the moral of that story is when you have a positive product, you end up selling something very interesting that American worker owners want to buy. So there are many stories like this. Um, we have stories in New York City. We have stories in Cincinnati. We have stories in Pittsburgh. Uh, we have stories in Denver. Um, we have stories in Chicago. We have stories um, in cities that um, none of you might even think about, um, but are very vital stories, and they're happening around us. And so this explosion happened for us in 2009 when uh, Leo Gerard, who's the president of the United Steelworkers Union, and if you don't have an opportunity to meet Leo, uh, you should go make that opportunity because he's truly one of the authentic, visionary labor leaders um, in this world. Uh, comes from Sudbury, Canada, um, crawled out of a mine, and um, is a person who has never forgotten where he comes from. And he had, he had the, the, the courage to reach out and do something that the Steelworkers Union, which is America's, North America's largest manufacturing union, 1.2 million members, highly diversified union, uh, we reached out to the world's largest work industrial cooperative, which is Mondragon, in 2009. And we did this because some of us were going to President Obama's 2009, uh, December 2009, job summit at the White House. And we were either going, we were staffing, preparing position papers, 
And what we knew was that nothing interesting was going to happen then. And that's not, not a knock on the president, a person whom I totally admire. It's a knock on the level of thinking um, in terms of economic development that goes on in this country. So we thought that we would um, shock jock it a little bit and, and, and uh, do something that nobody had thought about. We, we signed an MOU. It was tying two big ships together. I used to be a naval officer. And you learn that when you tie two big ships together, the way to do it is carefully. <laughs> so, 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 so we did that. We did that, and, and we decided, well, you know, this is us uh, maybe just talking to ourselves. And we put out a little um, blurb the day before uh, to the local Pittsburgh newspapers, not having any idea what, who was going to answer the call. We had a telephone call. It wasn't a video call. There were nobody sitting in the room except us. And um, they asked us perfunctorily a couple of questions. And the next day, we were on the front page of the business section of the New York Times saying, you know, worker owners unite unions and co-ops, um, something. And that started a deluge and an avalanche of interest, which we were totally unprepared for. Um, and we realized humbly that we were about to screw up perhaps a one in a generation opportunity. So we did the right thing. We formed a 50-person advisory committee of people a lot smarter than ourselves. It was very easy to find. And we went on a listening tour because this was right after 2008. Every city in America had a sob story. There was desperation. There were people standing in lines. There was no hope. People had no jobs. Their homes were underwater. Um, you know, trillion dollars lost of middle class, working class assets. Um, so. In, in March of 2012, uh, we put together a template. It's 30 pages. You can get it on union.coop. And this template has stood the test of time. Uh, it was a model. It shows you exactly how to put together a union co-op and why. Um, after that was launched in the atrium of the Steelworkers Building in Pittsburgh, then we had unions all over the country calling us up with ideas. And we have been trying to keep up with these people ever since. And because we could not keep up with them in our present state, as much as I hate any form of structure, as anybody who knows me knows, we were forced by the plentitude of the overwhelming response uh, to our model, our hybrid model, to create a nonprofit, which is OneWorkerOneVote.org. And this is uh, an organization that has nine co-founders. Leo Gerard, the president of the Steelworkers Union, is on the board. And a lot of organizations helping us. Uh, CUNY Law School, the CUNY Law Foundation is our fiscal sponsor, thanks to Carmen. California Council of Churches, Ohio Employee Ownership Center, MIT CoLab. I mean, there's just a lot of organizations, the Cincinnati Union Cooperative Initiative. There's so many organizations that are with us, helping us, the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives, which are located here. So many, so many organizations that are helping us. We're now in 16 different cities in America in various degrees. We have projects all over the place. And uh, what we are proving is that our hybrid model is a model that allows everyone to be themselves and take, one, take themselves one step further. For the cooperatives, it's one worker, one vote. It's equal share, equal ownership. And for the unions, it's a collective bargaining agreement. And so I'm going to answer the question that I always get, which is, well, if you're a worker and you're an owner, why do you need a union? And I've had this question asked of me so many times that if my answer isn't convincingly good, I have nobody but myself to blame. <laughs> in Mondragon, we have something called a social committee. It's the same thing as a union. We believe that either, even with one worker, one vote, even with 60 years of experience under our belt, even with our principles, which state that labor is sovereign and capital, while important, is always subordinate to labor. Um, put that into American. What that means is, folks, you need to own your labor and rent your capital. Even with those principles, you can still have differentials. You can still have pressure, the wrong kind of pressure seeking the wrong kind of vacuum. There can still be a differential between the person in the office with maybe a window and the person on the factory floor. And to make sure that we have robust structures built in, redundant robust structures built in so that these things are personality independent, that, that even with Attila the Hun at the head of this cooperative, you know, we still would have our democratic governance. 
um, we have a social committee. And that's essentially the role that the cooperative, uh, the CBA, the collective bargaining agreement, plays in the union co-op model. Um, the unions bring a lot of things to the table. Not only the solidarity economy, not only the ability to punch above their weight, which is something the cooperative movement in this country, even with 29,000 cooperatives, 350 million America, uh, memberships, and $3 trillion in assets, have never learned how to do as of yet. Even with that, they bring training, they, they, bring, uh, they bring market business development, they bring knowledge, they bring, wealth, they bring um, industry knowledge, and they bring the welfare of their people to the table. But they also bring these incredible health care plans and pension plans. And so our union co-op model sends its worker owners out into the marketplace with the best possible benefits at the lowest possible cost, with the highest connection to the industries that they're, um, that they're penetrating, and everybody has an equal share ownership. I mean, what's not to like about that? <laughs> so, because I'd like to save some time for questions and answers if Georgia allows me, Georgia will not allow me. Uh, because I'm closing my presentation right now, uh, <laughs> I would like to just end it with uh, the priest, uh, Father Jose Maria Ariz Mendireta, which um, that took me 10 years of practice to get that one out. <laughs> the priest started with the school because he knew that education, knowledge transfer, is the ineluctable key to advancement. To you can't, you know, in D.C. we say, if you don't know the road you're taking, any road will take you there. And we find ourselves on all those roads that are taking us somewhere without knowing exactly where we're going. So the priest created a school. And we don't have the luxury of, of cookie, cutter, cookie cutting a mondragon from the Basque region of Spain, the Spanish Civil War, World War II, um, over here, because does, things don't work like that. You cannot transplant culture, history, um, people's DNA exactly. But what you can do is you can eclectically pick out things and put them into another context. So if you look at the Mondragon Triangle as the university, the mutual, and um, the bank, we now have a signed MOU that was announced last September with National Cooperative Bank in Washington and Labrador Cucha, the Mondragon Bank, and, and Pio, who have spent, who, Pio Aguirre, uh, my colleague from Mondragon, will be talking to you about um, Lagun, uh, Caja Laboral, or Labrador Cucha, which is a major force behind Mondragon's development. He'll be talking to you about that. So we now, we don't have the bank, but we have a combination of the two banks working together. And um, in terms of the insurance mutual, uh, we're working closely with uh, Sarah Horowitz and the Freelancers Union on her concept of the new mutualism. And we're taking the Fagor examples of the products that you need for the downside, because every organization, no matter how it's structured, will always face a downturn in market cycles. Nobody is immune from a market cycle. The key is, what do you do? How do you absorb the blow and pick yourself back up? And so there's a whole market now, products for the downside, that we're co-developing. And on the education side, we have teamed up with Mondragon University and City University of New York through Carmen and MIT CoLab. And there's about 30 other educational institutions around the country waiting in the queue. And we are launching the Mondragon University online degree in social economy and cooperative enterprise in June of 2015, starting in New York City, but soon around the country. We'll be working through our partner universities. We're going to bring Mondragon to you, not expect you to go to Mondragon. We'll leave that up to Georgia. Um, and, and, and we will train the trainers. We will work with the professors in those universities so that they teach the course to their student. We won't disintermediate anyone. We will empower everyone. And we intend to form a dynamic community of professors who teach this and students and graduates who are learning it and who have or, or who have passed the course and we want to take those communities and move them forward exactly like uh, the priest did in Mondragon but in a more digital American context given the diversity and breadth of our geography. So I'd just like to leave you with a quote from New York Attorney General 
Eric Schneiderman, who you might not remember, but um, he is uh, he's rapidly becoming our hero in terms of going after Wall Street perpetrators. Uh, the financial, the 2008 financial sabotage that whiplashed our economy and left working class people and middle class people literally and figuratively in the street. And in The Nation, and I did this for you, in 2008, he wrote, in 2008, he wrote, quote, history teaches that the overwhelming majority of elected officials follow movement builders outside government when it comes to the new and risky. Once you recognize it, demand it and reward it, and it will happen. So it is beginning to happen. Work with us and let's make it happen more. Thank you. Thank you.